This episode of Real Ag Radio is brought to you by high-performing new Carbine Insecticide from FMC. Carbine Insecticide delivers fast, selective, and extended control of aphids in alfalfa and pulses, leaving beneficials like lady beetles to help in the fight. Ask your retailer today. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Radio and RealEggCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Wednesday, midweek edition of the show. Already midweek. Week is flying by. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your work day. And of course, big shout out to everybody else listening on the Real Ag Radio podcast, no matter where you are listening to us from. And continue to tell your friends, your family, your neighbors all about this great show dedicated to the industry that we all love, which is agriculture. And we're going to dig into some big issues here today. Looking forward to it. We're going to hear from Rene Waugh. He is the chair at the Canadian Pork Council. Now, the Canadian Pork Council, similar to their protein peers at the Canadian Cattlemen's Association, quite concerned about the UK joining the CPTPP deal. Now, is, is it just that simple? No, it's about the granular details here. It is in terms of the UK's lack of recognition of some clearly scientific issues around uh, Canadian proteins. And, and, and from the Canadian perspective, there isn't an issue. It's the UK that is using things like carcass, wa- carcass washing with beef. And in the case of uh, pork, it's about growth hormones using those issues against Canada to really just keep Canadian product out of the country and really behave in a very protectionist manner. And it has the protein industry in Canada very riled up. We're going to hear from Rene Watt today all about the pork side of this issue. We're also going to hear today from Tyler McCann. He's Managing Director at CAPI. He's going to also be joined uh, on a bit of a panel discussion with me and Tyler. It'll be Kelvin Heppner of Real Agriculture. You hear Kelvin here every Friday on the Real Ag Issues panel. We're going to talk about a new episode of the Ag Policy Connection podcast that Kelvin's been hosting, doing a great job. This week's episode is all about business risk management programs, a bit of the history of them in Canada, and in a little bit more fascinating is the direction that we go forward. Of course, we have a new Canadian egg policy framework that is just like we're a week into it. But sort of thinking out onto the horizon, what could business risk management look like in Canada for producers? We're going to talk a little bit about that. Of course, the, the Egg Policy Connection podcast is co-presented by Real Agriculture and CAPI. It's a great partnership. We'll also have time today for the top ag news stories of the day. If you have any feedback on today's program, we'd love to hear from you. I don't care if you agree, disagree with me or any of the guests. We want to get your opinion on the record and uh, really learn from each other. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or you can uh, follow us across all the different social media platforms. Or the other option, which is a great one, is for you to call the Real Ag Listener Line. It is 855-776-6147. You dial that number, you l- you press the number three, and you leave me a message, okay? So you don't need to come on live on the air. Don't worry if you're a little bit nervous about that kind of stuff. You just got to dial the number, press the number three, and leave me a message, and uh, we'll play some of that on the show. That is 855-776-6147. I don't want to really complain about the weather, but really, for the most part, across the country, Mother Nature is not is not being our friend. Winter, still here. Is it April or February? What's happening in the Northern Plains? You look at uh, some of the, 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 the weather hitting uh, parts of the Western Canadian prairies. You look at uh, Lindsay Smith, uh, our editor, for realagriculture.com is in Ottawa, and it's it's a brutal day there today. So, yeah, spring feels somewhat elusive on a day like this, but next week for different parts of the country feels a little bit better. So I think next week 
it's going to feel a little bit more spring-like. Let, let's hope. Um, I know it's uh, that forecasts can sometimes be a little bit misleading and teasing to us, but I, I'm hoping that next week is a little bit better. Let's take a break. When we come back, we're going to get to Rene Waugh. He is chair of the Canadian Port Council. We're talking the UK being a little bit, uh, there being some trade scoundrels. We'll talk about that right after this. It's now time for a product spotlight with Alpine, and we're joined by Steve McQueen. Steve, talk about Alpine by OK. What it does for us is it allows us to increase metabolism within the plant using the acetate, how it enters into the you know the energy basis within the plant. Not only does potassium increase ATP energy, but the acetic acid, the, the acetate itself, allows that plant to pick up a metabolism, which will increase the ability for plants to exudate into the soil and in turn allow plants to use the nutrients from the soil and move them much more efficiently within the plant. We increase the microbial activity in the soils and we know that it's a food source for them. And when you energize the soils and the microbials, you then take advantage of your compost, your manures, your dry fertilizer programs. And what we're able to do is just uh, create a synergy, upregulate the plant, and we can use the nutrients to their utmost efficiencies. Hey, Steve, if somebody wants more information, where do they go? www.alpine.com or contact the DSM all across Canada. Farming is one of the most demanding jobs in the world, which is why farmers deserve an advantage. The Pride Seeds Advantage. For maximum yield, tonnage, and return on investment, get best-in-class seed genetics together with industry-leading trades and seed treatment protection. Plus, you can work directly with the Pride Seeds team to get personal agronomy guidance and products designed to help you take full advantage of your seed's genetic potential. Visit your local dealer today or visit prideseeds.com to learn more. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. Grow more, risk less, realize greater yield potential and address zinc deficiency while improving soil health. Solio Zinc delivers ROI you can count on and is backed with a product guarantee. Try it today. Learn more at solios.com. That's S-O-I-L-E-O-S dot com. Thanks to Solios for being on board with Real Ag Radio. Okay, uh, we're now going to talk about some more challenges in terms of the UK potentially joining the CPTPP. Joining us right now is the chair of the Canadian Pork Council. It is uh, Rene Roy. He is a pork producer from Quebec. Rene, welcome to the show. Hello. The Canadian Port Council says the, gov- the government of Canada's acceptance of UK restrictions on access to products in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreements is, is just further indication that negotiators have tied one hand behind their backs as they pursue rules-based trade. W- why does the Canadian Port Council uh, see it this way? Because uh, we, in the past, with uh, the, the trade negotiation we have done, especially with uh, Europe, uh, we have agreed for for uh, opening our market in exchange of some of their market, but uh, we we now know that uh, the rules are unequal. They are the uh, uh, European countries, including UK, in this uh, in, in in what we can see in the in the text right now, they are providing some uh, non-tariff trade barriers, which. Uh, blocks our entry to their uh, to their market. So, in fact, even if there is some uh, mar- market access on paper, it's not allowed in practice because of non-tariff trade barriers. Has there been any explanation why why the the Canadian trade negotiators, Canadian government would? I guess, go forward with the UK joining the CPTPP, knowing that it's it's impossible for Canadian pork to get into the UK based on their non-tariff trade barriers? We are currently working with the government to, to have clarification on this point. Um, it is clear that it is specific to our industry. So what one of our uh, uh, hypotheses is that uh, it is so precise for our market, for our meat market, that uh, uh, they must be clearly aware of what is happening, uh, what has happened in the past, uh, and uh, making sure that the text 
brings us to a different point. Mm. And it may not be easy to see. Uh, they are, for example, they are saying that uh, the UK is saying that uh, we are using a growth hormone. We shouldn't use growth hormones for uh, when we grow big, uh, which is not true. We are not using growth hormone in, in our Canadian pork. It's an example where they are misleading uh, the, not only the country and the negotiators, but they are also misleading other trade partners and the citizens about how we grow pork. We have our, uh, one of the best uh, production in the world, and we have also an inspection system that can, that can defy any other one in the world. So I am confident that it's just a matter of adjusting our tax. And if they don't want pork to be included in their market, they must be upfront and say so, but shouldn't play uh, uh, by uh, little rules on the uh, on the side and uh, bucking our market after we have agreements. Outside of the UK issue, has Canadian Port Council been happy with the CPTPP deal so far? Yes, uh, CPTPP has been a good one uh, for us. Of course, with uh, the uh, the COVID and the uh, the uh, problem of logistics has been tougher, but it was not because of the trade agreement. So I, I would say that this one was a good one, but they try, UK right now tried to copy what has been done in European Union. So we are not, we are not in favor of this kind of trade agreement. How, how big of an opportunity if if these non-tariff trade barriers were removed, how big of an opportunity is the UK market for Canadian pork exports? There is. Um, I don't have the numbers in, in front of me, but there because their their trade trade balance is negative, there is uh, a good potential for our uh, industry to uh, meet the demand in the UK. Uh, that's more a matter of of. Uh, Having a market access that is reliable, and we would have, we could propose uh, good products there uh, with a trade barrier, with, with a trade balance that is negative. It's clear that we could be competitive uh, in their market, and that may be one reason why they do that. Yeah. Uh, so now what? what? What What are the next steps, Renee? What What do you What do you feel needs to happen next in, in order for this to be rectified and for uh, Canadian Port Council to be satisfied with the UK and, and their membership into the CPTPP? What we are doing right now, we are working closely with the uh, the government, not only with. Uh, uh, CFIA, but also with uh, the, the trade uh, minister, so that we are able to find solutions. The negotiators, and we have we are in close link also with uh, Minister Minister Bibo, who has helped a lot in this process to to find solutions to uh, the uh, the struggle we have right now with uh, the uh, with the tax. Is there potential if the UK is ratified into the CPTPP and they, they engage in these kinds of trade behaviors uh, based on how, you know, some of the, the examples that you outlined here, is there a potential that some of the other countries, begin, it, it sort of sours the overall deal of the CPTPP and other countries start to engage in, 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 this, in this in an increasing way and that, that actually hurts Canadian pork exports in, in a bigger way than just the UK? I would say it's certainly a bad habit. So if we know that uh, non-tariff trade barriers could be built by any countries, we could also do it in Canada. We uh, we are trying to, to be good friends to others and, and good trading partners, and we, we avoid these kind of, of practice. But yes, everyone could do it, and it's certainly negative uh, negative behavior that could contaminate good uh, trading relationship. Um, I couldn't. I, I couldn't say how mm. the text. I don't have all the details, but uh, I would say that uh, it's important that we avoid these kind of uh, uh, situations that could have repercussions, negative repercussions for uh, our trade in uh, in other circumstances. 
Will, we heard from CCA last week that, uh, you know, if this isn't rectified, uh, because the beef industry has somewhat similar concerns to the pork industry on on this one, uh, they will lobby uh, on the Hill in Ottawa for Canada not to ratify. Will the Canadian Pork Council be doing the same? Will you be lobbying the government to not ratify this deal if if this is not fixed? Uh, For from our, from our perspective, one step at a time, now we are working with the government to find solutions. Uh, don't want, uh, we don't want to, uh, to work, uh, to, to walk two steps ahead. Let's do the first step, making sure that we can find solutions, uh, finding all the ways that we can uh, reduce these, these, these situa- this situation for our work in the market. And... Uh, we are not closing the door to any options, but for now, it's the, the, the dialogue with the government that is the most important. This has not been ratified yet. It's the opportunity for everyone to find a solution before there is any, any sort of, of ratification. Hey, Renee, to finish up here, I appreciate your time. Uh, how have uh, Canadian pork exports been, been going? Is it, have, have the numbers been strong? We've, we've improved since uh, COVID, uh, especially on the value, uh, and which is a good news because uh, we had a pretty tough year. I would say two tough years uh, in rows. Uh, now things are getting better, especially with the Japanese market. Uh, some uh, potential also uh, uh, additional potential uh, market in, uh, in East Asia. So uh, this is getting better. But I would say that uh, we, we, we followed some steps in the ladder, so climbing up again takes a little bit of time. Uh, it's, it was the market situation, economic situation for, for uh, notably uh, Japan, so it took time, it took time for us to, uh, it takes time to, for us to, to, to get back to where we were. We've been talking to Rene Waugh. He is the chair of the Canadian Port Council. Rene, thanks so much for joining us here today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Some of you probably were listening to that discussion with Rene Waugh and are like, oh, this is rich. Canada saying that other countries are, are using or finding fine print or you know technicalities to prevent trade deals from being actually executed. This is exactly what New Zealand and the U.S. have been saying about Canada when it comes to their free trade deals and the allocation of the TRQs. Now, fair... Having said that, that's not pork's problem. That's not the cattle industry's problem, (laughs) right? And, and, And what we have here is a situation where the UK was able to behave like this under the old CETA agreement and now want their cake and want to eat it too when it comes to the CPTPP deal. And pork and beef are speaking up. Now, we did hear there that pork is trying to work with the government to address the things that need to be changed. We heard from the CCA last week, uh, that interview, Nathan Finney, the chair of the CCA, he was on uh, Real Ag on the weekend, and also that interview is posted at realagriculture.com, where he, they outright said, listen, if this isn't fixed, we at CCA will lobby MPs against ratifying the UK into this trade deal. They feel, you know, I think both proteins feel very ignored. They're, as they're, they're concerns not addressed and their concerns and their industry, their potential for exports have been completely sacrificed in order to close this deal. And uh, that's not sitting very well. So we'll see how this all continues, breaks down. And uh, if there is changes that are pushed for some sort of bilateral agreement with the U.S., and, or sorry, bilateral agreement with the UK going forward. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we've got more on Real Ag Radio right after this. As you head out into the field this season, the Corn School's got you covered. Everything from tillage discussions, weed control info, field trial results, yield strategies, and more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BASF. Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. 
We are right here on the trade show floor, Commodity Classic. We got a product spotlight with Azotic, and we're right now we're talking to Tom Tregano. Tom, what, what does Invita do? So Invita is a nitrogen fixing bacteria that can fix nitrogen in all kinds of different crops. So beyond corn, which is the main focus for us, but we can fix nitrogen in everything from wheat to soybeans and even some of the um, high value crops like potatoes and uh, sugar beets. What's unique about it is it fixes nitrogen right inside the cells of the plant. So we're not talking about, uh, it's not inside the roots, so it's a foliar or an inferro application, and it gets basically systemic from the leaves to the roots, which gives the guys a lot of flexibility on how they use it. If growers are interested in Invita from Azotic, where do they find it? Best place to go is to talk to your local retail. Another way to contact us is through our website, www.azotic-na.com. I get super revved up about some of these trade issues. I, I find them just so fascinating, the relationships between the countries and how you know countries can take a stand on one commodity and have a bit of a different stance on another, which is something we obviously see uh, very readily in Canada, for sure. I, and we don't even need to dig into that. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm also interested in how the Conservatives react here because the opposition, the Conservative Party of Canada, has been, I, I, I think, relatively quiet on, on the CPTPP deal and uh, hasn't necessarily spoke up in support or you know, maybe their quietness is uh, somewhat strategic at this point. Well, we'll just see if they, if they step out and support the protein industry on uh, some of their, their discussion or talking points and some of their claims in terms of the, the failure for some of the Canadian trade negotiators on this one. But let's get into a, another topic here that's somewhat trade-related, and it's a story from The Logic. And we'll get to that in a second. But first, I want to mention that this segment's brought to you by Granny Boar from U.S. Borax. You go to borax.com, and make sure when you think about Granny Boar from U.S. Borax, you ask for it by name. There was a story in The Logic, which is a great, great uh, website that I subscribe to. And it was talking about a meeting that was recently held on U.S.-Canada relations. And this happened actually in in Toronto. And and why this interests me is because I I think it kind of fits into some of the things that I've been telling audiences as of late in some of my speeches. And that is, and and I have been including Mexico into this, but maybe for not to bite off too much, maybe we need to think more from a Canada-US perspective first. I don't know, but I I think Mexico, because we do have this USMCA deal, Kuzma, right? NAFTA 2.0, whatever you want to call it. We have this trade agreement, and I've been telling audiences that you know we do have differences, and we do need to maintain sovereignty, of course. Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. But we need to think more as an economic block. And, and that's not just about cooperating on the global stage. It's more than that. It's about you know, thinking about strategic infrastructure together. Right? We've got a lot of goods flowing back and forth across the border, things like that. And I, I think sometimes, obviously, we, we, we do have a very, very strong relationship but there's things that get in the way of us seeing, sometimes I think, the bigger picture. So that's, that's what I've been telling audiences a, as of late. And uh, this story in the logic sort of sparked my, uh, my interest in, in, in sort of partnership of that thought. Okay? So uh, it says, uh, if you ask David L. Cohen, the relationship between Canada and the U.S. is the envy of the world. Every other country in the world would trade a relationship with a relationship with the most important ally, said U.S. Ambassador to Canada on Tuesday at the U.S.-Canada Summit in Toronto. The day-long event hosted by Eurasia Group and BMO brought together hundreds of business leaders, economists, and policymakers to take stock of the two allies' relationship and discuss how their friendly foundation can benefit in a world that's poised for less globalization and what could be persistently higher interest rates. The U.S.-Canada Summit in Toronto on April 4th, uh, sorry, the, the day's big themes were the state of globalization, the green energy transition, and the carrots and sticks that will clinch North America's dominance in a rocky global economy. Here are some of the highlights. So now, 
I, I, just to, to intercept here, I, I think that really sets the stage very, very well. So let, let's continue. So shots fired at the Inflation Reduction Act. In a session with his Canadian counterpart, uh, Kirsten Hillman, Cohen defended the sweeping U.S. strategy to fight climate change, which stakeholders in Canada have criticized as threatening Canada's ability to compete against its giant neighbor. There are many people in Canada who don't love the ROA, don't love the IRA, he said, adding that many also don't fully understand it. So the U.S. $369 billion initiative isn't at all protectionist, Cohen argued, noting that Canadian companies are also eligible for its incentives. If the act works, he said, Canada will be a major beneficiary. Hillman, meanwhile, said the IRA forced Canada to react and devise its own plan, which came in the form of a Canada Growth Fund and other tax incentives introduced in the federal budget earlier this month. Yes. Uh, and we've had uh, John Stackhouse is an example. He, you know, with, with RBC has talked about how Canada needed n- and needs to, going forward, respond to the IRA. Missed opportunity, maybe, for us to maybe be a little bit more collaborative when it comes to some of like an initiative like this, but hey, you know we can't uh, we can't ask for the moon, I guess. So the, the story continues. The case for strategic globalization. Okay, so on this point, Cohen and Hillman both push back against the idea that globalization is coming to an end. I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon because it's too deeply entrenched, said Hillman. What is happening in a strategic realignment in specific sectors in order to deal with particular vulnerabilities that we have started to understand and unravel a bit willful blindness we have had. Okay, so uh, now's the time to grow deep roots. Now on this point, and this gets into sort of what I've been talking about with audiences, while both Hillman and Cohen agreed the strong relationship between Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and President Joe Biden is good for their respective economies, they said it's important to lay the groundwork for a future in which the country's leaders may not be as friendly. I think it's essential that we seize this moment and that we do the most w- with it while it exists, said Hillman, pointing to potential in, in joint economic and R&D projects. When our country's vision isn't aligned, it's not like we don't get things done, but there could be an opportunity right now to supercharge some activities. And I, I also would add to that, like I said previously, infrastructure planning, strategic infrastructure planning as, as an example, right? So anyway, uh, would be very interested in your thoughts. And of course, there's disagreements. Uh, Canadian dairy policy, U.S. desire to obviously export more dairy products into Canada. Uh, we talked about this earlier, right? There's an example. Uh, there obviously, we've had trade battles when it comes to things like softwood lumber, as an example. Uh, steel aluminum tariffs on Canada during the Trump administration. So, But these things are they, they're moments in time that can be overcome. And we, do, and we do overcome them because we do, over time, see we tend to see the bigger picture and what we can accomplish together. It's obviously to Canada's benefit to have a very, very good relationship with the largest economy in the world, the world's largest <laughs> border between the two countries. But it, but you know, it's not a one-sided, it's not a one-sided relationship. Okay, uh, Canada is very also very important to the U.S. A- as well. Canada's the largest purchaser of U.S. ethanol. Canada uh, on 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 some years will buy over a billion dollars in beef for the United States. Just as little examples. Um, so yeah, there's there is a big opportunity. I'm interested in, in what your thoughts are. Send me that email s haney at realagriculture dot com. Great stuff coming out of the logic and and covering that meeting, talking about opportunities between Canada. And the U.S. Okay, let's take a quick break. When we come back, I'm going to bring in Tyler McCann from Cappy and Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, and we're talking business risk management right after this. If you grow soy or edible beans in Ontario, you know that sclerotinia white mold is no joke. Yield loss can be devastating, and timing fungicides can be complicated. But did you know there's a new seed treatment that can help mitigate yield loss? Start the year off with your best foot forward against disease. Ask your seed supplier or local Agrimart group to pre-treat your beans with Heads Up. Part of a complete white mold management plan, ask your seed dealer about Heads Up today or visit headsupst.com. 
How's your seed quality? What should you treat with? What about herbicide carryover and environmental concerns? Spring is here, and you've got a lot of things to think about in regards to your pulse crop. The Pulse School on Real Agriculture has information and advice for all these questions and more to help you navigate this season. Brought to you by BASF. Pulse School episodes are available at PulseSchool.com, RealAgriculture.com, or as a podcast on your favorite streaming service. Download the latest episode today. Whether you're seeding, harvesting, or anything in between, the Wheat School on RealAgriculture.com has you covered. Timely agronomic information from industry experts available online anytime. Give your wheat crop a good start and a great finish with the Wheat School on realagriculture.com. Brought to you by CNM Seeds, Syngenta Canada, and the Alberta Wheat and Barley Commission. And welcome back to Real Ag Radio. We are now going to talk about a new episode coming out of the Ag Policy Connection podcast hosted by Kelvin Hepner. We're joined right now by Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture. Hey, Kelvin, how's it going? Doing well here, Sean. Also joining us is the Managing Director at CAPI, the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, is Tyler McCann. Tyler, welcome back. Thanks, Sean. Always good to be with you guys. This is, you know, Kelvin, this is really great. We've had Tyler on, like, what this is three weeks, four weeks in a row now? This is like we're we're getting special attention here. Yeah, this is nice. This might be four weeks in a row now that we've been able to tap into Tyler's vast egg policy knowledge here. Well, yes. if you guys nice. uh, you guys ever want to dive into the weeds on ag policy in Canada, always happy to join you. Oh, as we do. We do. Okay. Yeah, uh, like the- we, we've got a new episode of the Ag Policy Connection podcast. Kelvin, uh, this week it's all about BRM. Business risk management. Yes, we're talking business risk management. A bit of the history of of what we've had in Canada in the past and how it evolved from the NISA program that uh, some of our audience might remember from the 90s uh, into what we have today with Agri Stability, Agri Invest, and Agri Insurance, or crop insurance being kind of the the three big pillars. And so we talk about uh, what we have today and and what it might look like in the future uh, as uh, there are many different shifting factors, I would say. We haven't seen a whole lot of change to our farm support programs in Canada over the last uh, 15, even 20 years, going back to the start of the the current ag policy framework uh, kind of structure. But uh, there certainly the risks have changed and the priorities politically and, and elsewhere have, have changed along the way. And so what might business risk management for farmers, for agriculture look like in the future. Those are some of the things that we dive into on uh, this week's episode of the Ag Policy Connection, which is a, a partnership between the Ag Poli- or the Canadian Ag Policy Institute, Agri-Food Policy Institute, or CAPI, and Real Ag, of course. Yeah, these are these have been some great informative episodes. I've really, really enjoyed them. Um, Tyler, I know I've heard you say in the past that, you know, if you look at back at historically our, our BRM programs, like Kelvin just said, not a lot has changed and we haven't exactly, you know, when we do talk about change, it isn't necessarily, it's more tweaking than really kind of blowing things up and starting over again. Yeah, Sean, that's one of the points that uh, Steve Funk, one of the guests on the episode, I think made, you know, was really, we've done a lot of, we've spent a lot of time talking about BRM in Canada. The governments have consulted, governments seem to be in an almost never ending consultation process. There's been expert advisory panels and and at the end of the day, really not much changes. We we tweak the programs. There's a you know I think the the episode gets into some of the reasons why we don't see change happen. But really, for the amount of money that gets invested in these programs every year, the amount of uh, the way that some farmers rely on them, the amount of support that flows to agriculture and agri food, we really should be expecting more from change, and we really should be saying that you know the status quo is just just not good enough. But again, I think this episode dives into some of the reasons why that, you know, we're in this trap where we talk a lot about it. We talk a lot about how things like agri stability can be better, but we don't see a lot of change. Uh, are, are we likely to see big change? Like does, does that change the, the, the rate of change going forward? A lot of changes in that question, but <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Like, is, is there going to be a bit of an alteration going forward? Like if you think about it, when, I don't know, going back, like, say, 40 years and where agriculture fits uh, from a, you know overall Canadian taxpayer standpoint. Well, the attitudes on farm support programs from the federal government, will that look differently going forward, do you think? 
you know, I think that there's a, a couple of pieces that are going to drive uh, pressure for for change potentially. One, these programs, some of these programs are costing more money. If you look at, you know, the crop insurance premiums that governments have to spend, you know, you've seen stories uh, about the impact of this in Alberta and Saskatchewan in particular the last couple of years. So I think people are going to start to, you know, ask what are what's what what are we getting kind of for that that amount of money? Um, you know, there's this this growing kind of divide and change. We've got, you know, lots of small farms and lots of big farms and not many farms in the middle. So those farms all need different risks uh, to, to manage. They need different support. They need, a uh, government can play different roles. One program really doesn't do well kind of covering all of those those different types of farms. And, and, and again, we, I mean, we've heard this over the last couple of years where, uh, you know, some uh, are in particular really focused on how do we improve the sustainability and, and environmental outcomes of these BRM programs. Uh, and so I don't, you know, I don't think that pressure is going to go away anytime soon. So uh, I, I think that the kind of the writing is on the wall for big change. It, it didn't come in this program framework. Um, it might come in the next. And, and hopefully uh, this episode gives people some food for thought around, you know, maybe ways that we can change, maybe ways that we can get ahead of it and come up with a better, more proactive approach to what we'd like to see in BRM programming in Canada. Mm-hmm. So, Kelvin, who are this week's uh, guests on this episode? And I'm also interested in kind of some of your biggest takeaways. What what did you learn as you explored uh, this topic with the guests? Okay, so our panelists for this episode, we have three guests. Grace Skogstad, who is a longtime political scientist and professor at the University of Toronto. She's actually a distinguished fellow with CAPI, and uh, she's I would say one of the few mainstream political scientists that has paid real close attention to agriculture. And so she's got a real view on Fed-Prov relationships and also the international scene where Canada compares to some of the other countries. Uh, Then uh, Tyler mentioned Steve Funk. He's the director of MNP's Agriculture Risk Management Resources. And MNP certainly has a large private industry or private consultative role in uh, in business risk management across Canada. And then we have Al Mussel, who is a longtime agriculture economist and research lead with uh, with CAPI for this episode. So all three of them kind of have a, have a unique perspective, but also a lot of insight and, and experience working with the, the farm support programs that we have, uh, that we've had here over the last 10, 15, mm-hmm. 20 years. I'd say a few of the takeaways. One of the things that Tyler touched on was this issue of cross-compliance. And I think in negotiating the current ag policy framework, the Sustainable Canadian Agriculture Partnership, which we're actually in the the first week of here, uh, as it took effect April 1st, one of the things the federal government wanted was more cross-compliance, more criteria or incentives, signals to farmers to uh, to implement practices that reduce carbon emissions or or have climate outcomes in in mind. I think the province has pushed back on that to a large extent. And so we've really not seen much of a move in terms of cross-compliance. Farm groups also pushed back, in, or most farm groups pushed back against this as well. So this idea of wanting both business financial outcomes and also climate outcomes, this this mix of these two different goals for this single program, uh, that's one of the issues that we discuss in this episode with uh, Al and Steve certainly have some thoughts on it uh, as to whether that could work or whether government will have to come up with separate initiatives that drive those climate-related outcomes that they want. Uh, another challenge is, uh, is competitiveness globally, something that stuck out, uh, the issue of trade and how Canada, or not Canada, the world has over the last number of years, at least anecdotally, seemed to move away from rules-based multilateral trade. A lot of the history among behind business risk management programs in Canada has to do with uh, concerns about uh, uh, trade retaliation from the U.S., the U.S. coming after our hog support pay- programs and, and things like that uh, with the collapse of the hog industry in the 90s, for example. And so a lot of it was shaped by the rules at the WTO and the WTO dispute panel being dysfunctional due to the U.S. not appointing uh, members to that panel. Uh, the dysfunction there what does that mean? And and we've seen other governments around the world offer strong support payments to or programs to, to farmers. What does that mean for Canadian agriculture and the Canadian governments provincially and federally in terms of support that they offer to Canadian farmers yeah. to make sure they remain competitive? A couple of things. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Uh, so Tyler, building on that, how is, how is our BRM program structure viewed internationally? You know, we, we, we get, you know, we get a lot of attention in Canada on the U.S. Farm Bill. Uh, we hear about y- European farm subsidies a lot. 
you know, and sometimes though we don't get into the details of what that actually, what those are and what that looks like, but how do other countries view our BRM program? Are they jealous of it or do they see it as being, you know, something that doesn't necessarily evolve? You know, I, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody be jealous. If if they're jealous, they probably don't have a good understanding of what the programs actually are here in Canada. I think I think generally we're seem to be uh, uh, you know uh, scouts on this. Kelvin talked about trade compliance. We we tend to be very risk adverse when it comes to designing BRM programs. Again, we tend not to change. They tend to be the same. Government tends to offer kind of a, a mix of programs, and and so I think you know they're. If anybody does think about them, they're probably thinking that again. They're really not events in in the grand scheme of things. That that being said, you know, as much as I think that we probably should be open to being a little bit more risky when it comes to program design, I think we've uh, trade compliance has has kept too many options off the table and prevented us from really having a a good, honest discussion about ways that we could change. The reality is, you know, the pork producers group in the United States absolutely pays attention to to these programs we are an export dependent country and so so people do really watch and and change to make sure that none of our programs are crossing the line into these trade distorting subsidies and and again i, I always um i think that the pork is a good example where where the u.s national pork producers council is a typically a good ally and a good friend we've got good relationships with them but but they're not afraid to call canada out as soon as they think that we're unfairly subsidizing uh, our pork sector Kelvin, I've often wondered, you you and I have had this discussion on the radio show and off the radio show before, but I, I also wonder about the fact that it's a federal provincial cost share, if that's one of the reasons why it doesn't evolve at a little bit of a rapid, more rapid rate as well, because we're, we're, we're constantly having to negotiate and compromise. Oh, that is a huge part of it because of having so many different players at the table. Uh, yes, the FPT arrangement, that's one of the things we talk about in the episode too, where Grace makes the point that despite all the dysfunction and challenges that we've seen over the last five years in particular in terms of evolving or updating business risk management programs, agriculture is still a relatively highly functional FedProv territorial uh, meeting room versus some of the other uh, departments such as health for example so but yeah you're right i think there's so many different players uh budget constraints differ between the provinces and the federal government we've now seen the provinces in a bit better financial situation some of them that were uh, really tightening the purse strings so that's always a, a factor in this and and it goes back to the the cost share arrangement the 60 40 that is still seen as a, a pillar of uh, a lot of these programs uh in terms of the cost share between the federal government and the, and the provincial government. So it's something that we do discuss, like what does the future hold? Does We've seen Ontario go on their own with their risk management program, the RMP, and Quebec has, has always had their own programs. Do we see a bit of disintegration of that FPT arrangement down the road? Uh, that's I think that's something that's up for debate. Mm. And, and Sean, I think we, but I think we get let governments in Canada off too easy. Um, you know, the European Union has got a far more complicated convoluted governance structure, but they're able to do significant reform to their farm programs in ways that we can't in Canada. Yes, having to get federal and provincial governments to agree on changes is hard. No doubt there's a lot of different interests. They're different across the country, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't demand better when it comes to them getting around the table, rolling up their sleeves and delivering better, more innovative, more meaningful risk management tools for farmers. Well, and of course, Tyler, there also is the battle of simplicity versus complexity. Uh, it's obviously at a very diverse industry. So that obviously is where we end up with more complexity. But uh, from a farmer's perspective, you know, having something simple, I can understand what my payout is going to be and not need to have some sort of magical black box or a master's degree in calculus. Uh, this, this is always a bit of a tug of war as well. Yeah, we've all, we've all heard farmers complain about having to pay these big accounting firms big dollars in order to do the agro stability pa- paperwork. We can see there's maybe a bit of a vested interest in some of those firms and in, in protecting the status quo. But the reality is that having a program that is tailored to each farmer's needs is good for those farmers, right? Because you're not getting caught up in averages or other things. But it certainly does make the program. Uh, more complicated, right? This is always the trade-off that happens. Do you want something that's simple, that may less 
reflect your own individual situation or do you want something that reflects your own individual situation and gives you the money that you deserve when you need it but that's more complicated to fill out and you know these are some tough choices that we have to make but unfortunately we don't actually get to have these big tough meaningful discussions about uh reform we just tend to stay th leave things the way that they are Kelvin, I, I can only imagine how much fun you are having digging into some of these topics like this week's uh, episode of the Ag Policy Connection podcast, all about BRM. This is right in your wheelhouse. <laughs> You're right. You're, uh, you hit the nail on the head there. I, <laughs> I enjoy it, and I, I hope everybody in the audience enjoys it as much as I do, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And like Kelvin mentioned, this is a, a podcast that is uh, produced in partnership between CAPI, the Canadian Agri-Food Policy Institute, uh, Tyler, of course, uh, here with us today as a managing director, as well as Real Agriculture. So it's a, it's a gr great work, uh, great information. We've had a lot of great feedback from the audience, people really enjoying the deep dive and the the, the knowledge of the guests that have been contributing their thoughts and opinions on this one has been just second to none. So make sure you go to uh, download the next episode of the Ag Policy Connection podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find it at realagriculture.com. Hey, Tyler, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. You too. Hey, Kevin, I'm going to talk to you on Friday show. Sounds good. I'll be here. Awesome stuff. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147 right after this. If farmers know one thing to be true, it's this. There are a lot of factors you can't control. The weather, breakdowns, and a million other variables standing between you and a successful season. But for all the uncertainty, you wouldn't change a thing. Because that's farming. And that's why Coke Agronomic Services wants to make life on the farm a bit more predictable. From nutrient management and protection to seed enhancement, get the confidence of being in control. Visit CokeAgSolutions.com. Canola is more than just a pretty face in the prairie landscape. It's a big business, both here and around the world, that requires you to be informed and up-to-date on everything it takes to grow a successful crop. The Canola School on realagriculture.com has an expert library of video resources covering markets, agronomy, and more to help you grow a healthy and profitable canola crop. Visit canolaschool.com today. Brought to you by BASF Canada and Invigor Hybrid Canola. It's time for the Top Ag News Stories of the Day, brought to you by Heads Up Seed Treatment. Protect your beans from rhizotonia root rot, white mold, and SDS with Heads Up. Visit your nearest Agrimart location or visit headsupst.com to learn more. That's headsupst.com. Let's get to the top ag news stories of the day. Consumers and businesses are expecting inflation to slow faster than previously thought, but as high interest rates weigh on the economy, they're also adjusting their finances to account for a slowdown. This story from CTV, uh, they said that that's according to the Bank of Canada's first quarter business and consumer expectations survey, with the, which was released on Monday. The survey, which asked respondents what they think the annual inflation rate will be one, two, and five years from now, show expectations for future inflation falling. This comes as the actual inflation rate has been slowing for months, reaching 5.2% in February after peaking at 8.1% last June. However, businesses and consumers continue to expect inflation to remain above 2% until at least 2025. How Canada's agriculture sector can survive its retirement crisis? New report from RBC Royal Bank. According to the new report by RBC on Monday, 40% of Canada's farm operators will retire by 2033, and the country will need 30,000 new immigrants to establish new farms and greenhouses or take over existing ones to keep the sector sustainable, reports the Toronto Star. In 10 years, 60% of today's farm operators will be over the age of 65, never have so many many Canadian farmers being so close to retirement, warns the RBC study, which was t entitled Farmers Wanted the Labor Renewal Canada Needs to Build the Next Green Revolution. In 2021, the whole agriculture and agri-food system employed about 2.1 million people and provided one in nine jobs in Canada, generating $134.9 billion, or almost 7% of the country's gross domestic product. 
It had a chronic shortfall of general farm, nursery, and greenhouse workers and must and must rely on the seasonal agricultural workers program. But the report said that's just a stopgap because migrant laborers are not here year-round and may not return despite their essential skills in Canadian seeding and harvest. And uh, we talked about in the fourth quarter of 22, record amounts of uh, farms, agricultural operations using the TFW program. Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Egg Solution tells Brownfield the Northern Plains is getting a late season blizzard this week. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Building on existing snowpack, so spring flooding will likely delay planting at least another month. He said, I don't like that the Climate Prediction Center is forecasting once we get through mid-April, there's a risk of cooler conditions in the north. In areas like central Illinois, Snodgrass says soil temperatures remain wet and cool at the start of April. When we drive around here, you see fields looking at the same way they did all winter. Like I said, it's is it April or is it February? USGA is forecasting more than 91 million corn acres and more than 87.5 million soybean acres will be planted this spring. Snodgrass says several things need to happen for that forecast to be realized. Ah, I think he's alluding there to some of those corn acres potentially in the north, like in states like North Dakota, switching into beans potentially, as, as I'm sort of putting some words in Snodgrass's mouth there, but I think I think that's what he's talking about. And of course, in the Red River Valley in Manitoba, I think the concerns about flooding are very, very real. I'm hearing that from more and more growers in that region. Of course, the carbon tax went up April 1st, and uh, those the increases are uh, really, it's a big concern for the agricultural sector. The Agricultural Producers Association of Saskatchewan, APAS President Ian Boxall, said the carbon tax increase has significant impact on agriculture. These additional costs come from our out of our bottom line because we're price takers who sell into international markets, Boxall said. The impact of these costs on farm operators or sorry, farm operations needs to be recognized to ensure we can remain competitive in international markets. And 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 this has been one of the challenges, you know, is there to be recognition that some of these domestic policies are making Canadian exports uncompetitive. In, when we compare ourselves to some of our major competitors, like, say, the south of the border, where there is no price on pollution in the U.S., right? So uh, good points there by Boxall. Hard to disagree with that. Well, though, uh, I think the government will. Potash prices fall with New India deal. So uh, Campotex, a Canadian-based joint venture, of course, with Nutrien and Mosaic, agreed to a potash contract with Indian Potash Limited for $422 a metric ton through September. That's well below last year's price of 590, the highest since at least 2013. The volume wasn't disclosed. The market looks to uh, the, the market looks set to remain soft, says Alexis Maxwell, Maxwell, an analyst at Bloomberg Intelligence. USTR uh, Catherine Tai continues to push trade policy focused on non-tariff trade barriers. Says others starting to agree, but gives no examples. So U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai today will deliver remarks at American University in Washington with her message remaining consistent as she tries to tout the Biden administration's trade policy to engage countries on non-tariff trade barriers versus pursuing traditional trade agreements that address tariffs faced by U.S. goods in foreign markets. Ty also will keep stressing the administration is working with its allies to take on unfair competition from China. Foreign countries and some of the world's largest agricultural companies are donating or lending hundreds of millions of dollars to Ukrainian farmers, marking an early push for Kyiv's allies to rebuild the country, even as the war shows little sign of ending soon. Uh, so country or co- companies like uh, Corteva, ADM, Syngenta, Bayer, all listed in this Wall Street Journal story, really talking about, or really just talking about how they're 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 one. Obviously, there's a humanitarian side to the aid they're providing, but also trying to establish themselves as supporters of the country for obviously a long term presence in in a country like Ukraine. So. Uh, Seed giants such as Bayer and Corteva say they plan to invest in the country over the next decade to help rebuild Ukraine's agricultural system. Bayer has said it is investing some $38 million in a seed plant in the country. Corteva says it intended to increase corn seed production in the region by 30% over the next five years. 
Um, we've got, uh, what else? Bear said it provided equipment to remove mines from farmers' fields. Grain merchants, Cargill, ADM, and Bungie have said they intended to keep shipping costs from the country down. Buying farmers' grain and exporting in a way to get them cash for their next crop. So lots of this uh, stuff happening. And uh, we'll see. Uh, I would assume that some of that aid will be much more long-term and uh, then, then maybe what we're going to see from some of the countries who are questioning how much aid, uh, how long the aid can go on for. But that, that is Ukraine. It is just Ukraine requires that aid or else they are really, really done for. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. Or, of course, you can find us across all the different social media platforms or call the Real Ag Feedback line, 855-776-6147. Thanks, everybody, for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. And we'll, of course, chat again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Thank you for downloading this episode of Real Ag Radio brought to you by high-performing new carbine insecticide from FMC. New carbine insecticide hits aphids hard with effective, selective, and extended control. It also has activity on ligus and tarnished plant bugs. Ask your retailer today.